Welcome back. We are going to be talking about pop art today. And pop art is usually seen as the first movement within the era of postmodernism. Thus far, we've focused on modernism, um, which can um, included from realism in the 1850s all the way toward abstract expressionism. With post or with pop art, we see postmodernism. Um, this is an era of thought beginning in the mid 20th century, marked by a questioning of the premises of modernism, especially the belief in linear progress, the idea of absolute truth. It is marked by skepticism, plurality, and relativism. Whereas with modernism, there is a sense that mankind was continually progressing, that each movement, one after the other, was taking us in a needed uh, direction. With postmodernism, we have begun to doubt that. We are not quite sure what progress would really mean, or if we, if we could all agree to one, um, one idea of progress. We also realize that we can't all agree on what absolute truth is, if it exists, how it can be known, and we realize we have such a diverse uh, array of personal experiences, um, just within any one culture, but even across the world, there are so many different ideas about truth. Um, and so this era is marked by skepticism, meaning doubting what truth or progress might be. Plurality, meaning very divergent ideas coexisting together simultaneously. And relativism, meaning that each person and or culture is defining truth and and life for themselves. Within the visual arts, postmodernism is characterized by multiple divergent movements happening simultaneously, such as today while we're talking about pop art, uh, we also want to keep in mind that minimalism is happening simultaneously as two very different responses to abstract expressionist art. There is a wide diversity in approaches to art making, um, also exemplified in those two contrasts. And then there's a breaking down of traditional boundaries. So whereas many modern artists thought of themselves as discipline specific, so they would say, like Jackson Pollock would say of himself that he was a painter, not just a general artist, but specifically a painter, or many sculptors might say the same thing if they were sculptors. Now we have artists who are uh, making work that are on these boundaries. It might be something that is you know, uses paint, but it's also three-dimensional, but it's actually hanging on a wall and kind of projecting from the wall, so it's hard to categorize it as sculpture or as painting. And then other artists might do a project that is a painting, and then their next project might be a film. And so there aren't the traditional boundaries of one media versus another. An additional boundary that is often being questioned is the boundary between art and life. So how how similar or distant are these things supposed to be? Pop art. Pop art tends to be um, very palatable, very familiar and friendly in the sense that it is calling up images from uh, mass culture, from television, film, advertisements. And, and so in that way it feels very familiar to our eyes and very easy on our eyes. This is one of the first images heralded as pop art, and this is actually by an English artist named Richard Hamilton. Pop art actually begins in the UK around 1956 and comes to the US by 58 and 59. In this piece by Richard Hamilton, he has titled it, Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing? And you're right to sense a little bit of, of humor and irony in that uh, title alone. And then, of course, if you go to the image with a formal point of view and just take in the different um, aspects, different images and, and formal qualities of it, uh, it is a collage. And so you first see perhaps these two figures in this room. And the two figures are certainly a, a kind of comically idealized version of themselves. Um, there's also interestingly placed objects, humorously placed, such as the lollipop that the man is holding or the lampshade on the woman's head. Um, it's also very telling in the other kind of household objects that are displayed around them. The television behind the woman's elbow, the ham on the table, the um, musical equipment down below, the vacuum here on the stairs. And these are objects that had started to be thought of as um, must-have household objects. The television, of course, is a, a relatively new invention and will um, be revolutionary in our everyday lives. The ham is an example of 
um, prepackaged food. So we began to move away from farm-raised and um, you know regionally created food, locally grown food, and move toward prepackaged, uh, maybe frozen dinners, canned goods, etc. And so in one way it's a great thing because we have access to uh, a different range of food than we might have before. On the other hand, we might be losing um, uh, nutritious qualities of the food, right, as they're being dried and, and shipped, etc. Um, and then the, the vacuum cleaner reminds us of these ideas of, of modern living, what the modern housewife needed to have to keep her household together. Um, don't miss up here on the ceiling, there's also uh, a moon, and that reminds us that there's also space exploration going on internationally here. So he's given us this depiction of what modern life um, has come to mean, and there's a great emphasis on consumerism and materialism here that um, every house is supposed to have these things, these kind of gender roles, these kinds of physiques, these kind of objects. Richard Hamilton also gives us a very handy uh, definition of pop art. He writes that it is popular, designed for a mass audience, transient, short-term solution, expendable, low-cost, mass-produced, young, aimed at youth, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, big business. And these, many of these could be positive or negative depending on how you look at them and, and your own uh, preferences. But I think a few interesting ones are um, the idea of transient and expendable art has not really been examined yet. We have tended to think of art before this era as more monumental and more universal and, and wanting it to last forever. And here he seems to be saying that art could also be about the moment. James Rosenquist is an American pop artist <clears throat> who's actually had quite a long career. Um, and this is an example of one of his works. He often juxtaposes images taken from um, culture at large. Uh, and so we have here these three different rows. And his images tend to be, in a sense, very playful in the way that we go about reading them. So formally, you could talk about the use of value versus the use of color in the lower row. Um, and the symmetrical image, or the symmetricality of the first two scenes versus the center one. But then we'd also want to use a mix of iconography, feminist point of view, um, social historical point of view, to track down this image and to see what kind of associations and meanings we can bring from it. The car, of course, should remind us about um, the American automobile um, business and, and that it was such a big defining business in the U.S. Um, we also often think of cars as defining us as individuals. We think our cars are a statement of who we are. Um, cars are more and more from this point toward our present day are more and more lived in. So you might actually eat a meal, right? Fast food being born in this day. Um, you might actually eat your meals in your car. You might go to the drive-in in your car. Um, this center row seems to be kind of a close-up of a love scene. So we have the sense of a, a woman's mouth and an ear behind her. So maybe she's whispering into the ear of her lover or kissing his ear. And the way that it's um, oriented here where she seems to be laying down um, also makes us feel like it might be intimate in some way. Um, so if we f start with the car and then this intimate scene, maybe it's an intimate scene happening in a car or maybe it's the cars at a driveway watching this kind of a film. Um, and then we get to the third row and it's this extreme close-up in color of what seemed to be something like SpaghettiOs or, you know, like uh, very red spaghetti. And it seems very silly, but also slightly gross, right? It's a little bit slimy, a little wormy, even sort of intestinal. And so we have this very playful and kind of surprising um, distraction from what seemed to be very classical, like a classical card, a car, this kind of romantic image, and then this sudden scream of, of color. Um, and I think there could be something about juxtaposing sort of a more classic tradition with this sudden new type of culture that's very much about ads that are jumping out to grab your attention or going from a more classic, quiet life to um, the prefab, um, pre-made food kind of idea. Um, there's also, you know, because of the orientation, there's something about the car grill um, hitting the woman and then the blood. So there's also sort of a dramatic, a darker uh, side to it as well.
So it's fun to play through these images and see how you can create meanings through the different juxtapositions. Another very well-known example would be the work of Roy Lichtenstein, who uses images taken from comic books or very similar to images in comic books. And he uses a style called a bende dot. So you can see in the skin tones of the woman that they're actually teeny tiny dots that make up her skin tone rather than just painting in a flat, um, uh, flat color. And then lastly, Tom Wesselman um, gives us here a still life, which is part collage and part painting. But again, he's depicting uh, objects that had become well-known and even considered mainstays of a, of a household in this era. And so there's a sense that, well, you're supposed to have Coca-Cola, you're supposed to have a certain kind of coffee or a certain kind of roast coming out of the oven. Um, there's a way in which art can reflect life for us and, and not just reflect it um, objectively, but sort of give us a chance to see our own lives, see ourselves, and make choices about where we want to go from here. So I think in many ways pop art is a reflection of life. Pop art has been described in such a wild myriad of ways. Um, the image, the lift on the left, is generally contradicting the list on the right. And I think it's fascinating that one art movement could have this variety of, of comments from critics and artists both. So do we see pop art as whimsical or is it um, negatively empty and vapid? Is it humorous and comical or is it just kind of jokey? Right? Is it simple or is it actually really complicated and, and educated? Is it actually smart? Um, could it be transient and expendable or in some way monumental? Honest versus deceptive, positive versus cynical and negative, sensation seeking or novelty and gag versus austere and necessary? Is it a passing fad, a see-through dress? Is it impersonal because it's advertising? Is it really kind of impersonal and distant? Or is it actually really democratic and accessible and open to all? Is it debasing or healing? fastidious or rough and hastily done. Um, this wild contrast of things um, might seem surprising when we look at pop art, which, which I think at first glance does seem, like I said, palatable and maybe even simple. But if we also look at the times from which it comes, it's a very contrasting or a time full of very con big contrasts. So we have the beginning of the fast food generation. So franchises like McDonald's get their footing um, in the 50s and start to set out these ideas of what family life could be. Like instead of staying home and cooking, you know, come out to the restaurants. It's wholesome. It's family oriented. Give mom a night off from cooking. Um, but it also, as it grows and crosses the country, instead of just being local restaurants, now you have these chains that do start to be... Um, uh, present all the way across the country and kind of homogenize life across the country. In the same way, television is actually quite a, um, has a homogenizing effect on culture, meaning people used to maybe have regional traditions or regional ways of passing the time, different sports or different um, activities that would go on. But with the television, we have this, um, this common bond, we could say on the positive note, that Americans across the country start watching TV. And instead of having their own local celebrities um, and local activities, now they have national celebrities. And instead of having local styles, you know, say from the West Coast to the East Coast to the South, you'd have your own kind of sense of style. Now there's the television in your home every day telling you what you should wear or what kind of accent you should speak with or what kind of roles um, you should have in your family. What does a traditional woman look like? What does a man look like? Um, how are kids supposed to behave? And so the television becomes this very informative um, aspect of culture. Um, interestingly, from about 1947 to 1957, um, televisions go from about 10,000 in the whole country to about 40 million. So over 10 years, it goes from 10,000 to 40 million televisions. And it really became something that every household had to have at least one of. Um, and, and maybe even by today, many households have two or three or um, several uh, computers as well to have internet um, possibilities. And so we're very used to this being a mainstay of our lives. But it's interesting to think about how it would have affected culture when it first um, began. <laughs> 
But not all of life was so simple and kind of booming at this time. There was also a lot of um, difficulty and disenchantment. There was the civil rights movement, um, people like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr., among many, many others, working for um, the civil rights of all minorities. Um, we also have uh, Cuba, um, the, the revolution in Cuba that put Castro in power, um, and he, of course, working with the Russians which was a big threat being so near the U.S. border. We have over in Europe, still um, following on World War II, even as late as 1961, the Berlin Wall was built, um, effectively shutting off half of that city from the rest of the world for decades. And, of course, we have the very beginning of the Vietnam War, which would affect not only the, the millions of, of men going over to war and women going over to the war and their families, but also, of course, the many protests that went on here in the U.S. So there's this high contrast in society of consumer, consumer society and then this really challenging period of um, social unrest both at home and internationally. Now, pop art will address more directly the consumer aspect of society, but I think it's important to note that, it's, that it has a complexity to it as well, um, that it's not all just sort of easy face value, although um, I think it's attractive and has a first entry point at that face value. So we have images like this by Andy Warhol of Campbell's Soup Cans, a completely banal object, one that you can see at the grocery store even still, of course. But what happens when he reproduces it and makes it into an art image and hangs it in an art gallery? Does the meaning change somehow? Well, critic um, Alloway writes a lot about pop art and has some interesting things to say. He says that um, he comments on the 20th century aesthetics to date, so before 1969. He sees that art had been very self-referential. So we talked about the idea of art for art's sake. Art had really been in a conversation with itself, self-referential and purely formal, which had been fruitful, but he saw it as being at an end, moving toward a new direction. He questioned the separation of fine art and popular culture and wondered if they didn't really need to be so separate after all. And he looks at pop culture as increasingly mechanized, abundant, art designed for simultaneous consumption by a numerically large audience providing information derived from and contributing to our statistically normal roles in society. So there's this idea that, the, that just as culture is becoming more um, mass-produced, our, our, our objects, our food, our clothing, our ideas via the television are becoming more mass-produced, so might art become a little more mass-produced, a little more mechanized, abundant, um, for simultaneous cons consumption. Now, if you're making something for simultaneous consumption, whatever it might be, it's going to have to be a little less nuanced, a little less special and specific to an individual, and a little more palatable and sort of um, pared down or simplified to be interesting to a mass audience, right? Um, so it's interesting to, to question, well, if something is widely popular, um, is it lacking its kind of individuality or, or specificity? He notes that TV, film, and each new media affects the previous one, not replacing them but adding complexity. So of course art has to change in an era of TV. It has to change in an era of film. We can't just see the same old types of artwork as before because every new media affects the previous one. He notes several important shifts. A shift away from masterpiece and toward representative or typical works a shift away from ideas of breakthrough um, and kind of a heroic breakthrough and toward the whole life of a person. <clears throat> a shift away from permanence and toward specificity in ephemeral works. And art is separate from life, moving toward art and life being intertwined. Um, if we think about art from the past ages through the Renaissance and, and in toward abstract expressionism, there had been such an emphasis on artists having this emotional and, and artistic breakthrough, making their masterpiece, finding their signature style, uh, making things that would last for hundreds of years, and that art was something very lofty and high, distinct from everyday life and everyday culture. And here pop art and culture at, at large is maybe more interested in something different, moving toward things that are um, 
perhaps less monumental and less of a masterpiece and more something that is related to their daily lives, um, more about the life of a, the whole life of a person, potentially more ephemeral. I think one argument for that is we have so many museums around the world filled with so much art and even storerooms and storerooms of art. If we just keep making more and more art that's supposed to last for hundreds of years each, um, some people would say, well, we end up with museums that function like graveyards, right? They're just full and full of these old things that maybe don't mean that much to us anymore. And so a lot of artists are, are interested in the idea of making specific works that might only last for a day or a year. Um, letting them be ephemeral, letting them be here for the moment, but not for all ages. Um, pop art is not replacing former movements. It's not a renunciation, but an incorporation. So they're looking at the movements of the past as well as current events and, and advertising and film and all of these new influences and trying to merge them all together, not replacing the past, but incorporating. And then pop art as representation of representation. Um, it is about signs and sign systems. And I really like this idea. I think it's very um, apt for pop art. That in the past, we've seen people rep making representations of the world around them. So they would represent, uh, you know, a person in a portrait or represent the landscape, represent a still life. But this, in pop art, it's a representation of a representation. So they're representing what is happening in advertising or in film. Um, and it's, it's helping us to question how we picture ourselves. So why do we picture ourselves the way we do in a comic book? Or why do we picture the, ourselves the way we do in advertisements? Is it honest? Is it accurate? So it's a representation of a representation. It's also a recontextualization. The meaning of a sign is changed by being set in a different context by the artist. So when we see a Campbell's soup can in the grocery store, and then we see an image of it in the, in the art gallery, we have a very different exp experience. In the grocery store, we have our grocery list. We're just trying to check things off that list, right, and get out of there. We're not really often thinking deeply or philosophically. However, when we go to an art gallery or museum, we um, know we have prepared ourselves to have an aesthetic experience and an intellectual experience. And so we look at things in an art museum or gallery differently than we do in the rest of the world. So there's a recontextualization. That context affects how we see the, the, the image or the sign. He sees a, a never-ending cycle of art feeding culture, which feeds art, which feeds culture, which feeds art, continuously. Now in the past, especially say in the Renaissance, the model was that art should be this lofty thing that feeds culture, that culture draws and, and gets inspiration or understands beauty via the arts or that culture understands um, philosophy or, or religious principles by looking at these paintings or works of stained glass, etc. But Alloway and pop artists seem to be saying that art and culture are feeding each other simultaneously and in a never-ending circuit. Many of the pop artists also reduce the artist hand. Remember that hand we've talked about as the, the idea of an artist having a signature style and a, and a brush stroke, you know, let's say that you can really feel their kind of fingerprint on the artwork. With someone like Lichtenstein, you don't see that at all. Um, here's a, an image of Lichtenstein, and, and these are his works. Now there is a signature style, but you never sense his actual fingerprints. Um, you don't see like a splashy brush mark or um, any sense of it being like a handheld, uh, you know, tool. He actually is making his paintings by hand, but they are immaculately crafted. Um, so you almost, they almost seem like a print. They're so clean. And here is a very good example of that idea of pop art being a representation of a representation. Because here he's given us this painting, which is a representation of a comic. And a comic is a representation, right? Um, it's interesting to question the difference between the reality of something and how we depict it. So the way a plane really acts and sounds and its real function in, in, in a war scene as this where it's shooting another plane, um, the reality of, of planes fighting in, in wars is quite different than a comic book version of war, right? Why do we do that to war? Distance it, kind of take the tooth out of it. So Lichtenstein gives us this image so that we can 
contemplate it in a different way than we do as we're flipping through the comic book and we just kind of take it at face value. Or here he gives us another comic book image of a, a, a woman, a kind of femme fatale, who says, that's the way it should have begun, but it's hopeless. Um, this, you sense this high drama. Now you sense it, but you don't feel it. I mean, I don't think that we're steer, uh, stirred to tears when we look at this image because it's very flat. Um, there aren't a lot of active spatial cues. There's not like a soft contrast of value. <coughs> These very flat shapes. Um, but we see that she's crying. We read the quotation. And we realize this is a, a comic book characterization of a woman probably caught in some tragic tale, right? And so it, qu it makes us question, well, why do we depict women this way? Why do we depict romance this way? Um, how truthful is it? How honest is it? Or these kind of images where he's doing a play off of the Matisse painting on the right. So Matisse, Henry Matisse is a French artist painting the first half of the 20th century. And then Roy Lichtenstein gives us the pop art version of that, which is really taken again, taken the tooth out of it, taken the kind of um, real feeling of the Matisse um, away and just given us a very flattened version of it. And I wonder if this is in some ways an accusation that Lichtenstein's making against um, a lot of the kind of flattening that we see in advertising and in film and television, that they just characterize, make a characterization of real life that sort of flattens it and takes all the nuance and feeling out of it. As with this last one by Lichtenstein, can we tell who he's kind of spoofing here? This should remind us of the Abexers, you know, who give us, who gave us those big juicy, you know, brush strokes and all the drips and the splatters. And those were supposed to be a sense of like this existential crisis and, and kind of taking action in this uh, difficult world. And here Lichtenstein gives us a cartoon version of that brushstroke. And it really just um, takes all the emotion out of it, takes all the, the heat of that crisis out of it, and just gives us this kind of flattened decorative image. Um, Warhol, probably the most, or not probably, definitely, <laughs> the most well-known of the pop artists, um, was a fascinating figure in and of himself. And he really sculpted himself as much as he did his individual artworks. So through the interviews he would give, the books that he would write, um, he, you could say in a certain way that his whole life was a performance piece, that he really crafted his... Um, uh, his persona in the public eye, and often in ways that seemed um, uh, empty and superficial, and he would make statements about himself as being a superficial surface person. <coughs> and yet, his when taken as a whole, his whole lifestyle and his work give us someone, give us an image of someone who's actually much more complex. Um, he starts off in advertising, making images like this. So. Um, talented as an artist, as a draftsperson, making individual drawings here, and having a sense of style. And he takes that graphic um, kind of advertising approach from the marketplace into the art world. And makes images like these, again taking a banal Campbell soup can and making it into an artwork that we have to um, come to terms with in a different way when we see it in an art gallery than when we see it on the shelves of our grocery store. Now, some of his first soup, soup cans he actually painted by hand, but then he realized that it could be much more efficient if he screen printed them. And so he began to use screen printing um, very often throughout the rest of his career. He also took these kind of ready-made images like the Brillo boxes. So a Brillo, if you're not familiar, is basically kind of a scrub or a, spr a sponge that you might use for dishes, let's say. And he remade boxes. So he actually did make these himself. Um, cardboard boxes that were screen printed with the Brillo logo. But he's really challenging us and being um, absurd but and, and funny, but also making a really interesting point. So, you know, art has been so interested in celebrity and as well as pop art, or, or sorry, pop culture is very interested in celebrity. So he says, well, I'm a well-known artist. I'm a trained artist. So is anything I make art? And then he also sort of questions, well, if I put it in an art gallery, does that make it art? And if people are willing to buy it, does that make it art? So there's all these questions, and people did buy these for much more costly. Um, they were much more costly than an actual Brillo box at your grocery store would have been. 
Um, but people wanted the Brillo boxes that were made by Warhol and that were exhibited in, in these art galleries. And so he sort of plays on these boundaries of what art is or isn't. Um, interesting quote from him, he says, What's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same thing as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and just think, you can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the, st on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it, the president knows it, the bum knows it, and you know it. So there's this very cheeky uh, but true point, the, this idea of, of consumer culture kind of homogenizing and leveling the playing field, that there are some products that we all sort of get the same thing no matter how powerful or rich and famous or not we might be. And he does the same when he takes those Campbell's Soup cans or the Brillo boxes and takes them out. Now you can get it for very cheap or you can get it for a more expensive price from the gallery, but and either way, you can have your, uh, your work, your artwork. Andy Warhol also uh, developed himself and his sort of brand, you might say, into a much larger enterprise. He actually developed what was called the factory. So his studio wasn't just a place for him to work in isolation, but he actually brought in many other creative people, um, often from kind of the outskirts of society, and brought them in to work together in this factory. Um, it was kind of a seedy lifestyle. There were a lot of drugs and alcohol and, and other things involved, um, but they also produced this enormous body of work. Now Warhol would usually come up with the ideas himself or at least approve them, but then the other people in the factory would make the paintings for him or with him. He would have final approval again, and then the works would be sold under his name. So with Warhol, we have a shift in the idea of an artist toward artist as kind of CEO or artist as manager, um, calling the shots but letting someone else do the work. <clears throat> um, if you're thinking that some of these this sounds familiar, you might be realizing that pop art, of course, is connected to Dada. So Dada was that early 1900s movement that we looked at um, with Marcel Duchamp. They thought of themselves as an anti-art movement. And it, with Dada, that was a little more radical. They really wanted to break down all the establishments in the art tradition. With pop, I don't think it's quite as dramatic, but I do think that they question what is or isn't art and try to open up that boundary between art and life. Um, you might recognize these two works by Duchamp, the LHOQ on the right, and his ready-made bottle rack on the left. So this is just, at the time, a very ordinary object, a bottle drying rack that he brought into the gallery and said he, you know, he wanted everyone to look at it as an aesthetic form rather than in life as a utilitarian form. And so he called these his ready-mades. And of course, both Lichtenstein and Warhol, as a part of pop art, are using ready-made images, images from comic books or from advertisements, and using that same form in their artwork. There's also a sense of irony, absurdity, and wit in pop art that seems related to Dada. Another connection a little bit further back would be a connection to realism of the 1850s and 60s. Um, this image here by Gustave Courbet reminds us that realism was focused on the everyday modern life and on the unheroic. So these are anonymous manual workers. Um, they were at this time not considered um, valid uh, theme for for art. Art was supposed to be about heroes and biblical characters and mytho mythological characters and Courbet gives us these anonymous workers um, which was considered very low art at the time and yet he considered it um, very important to reflect everyday modern life. And There's definitely a way in which pop uh, art tries to do that. That you know Warhol takes that banal object and gives it a sense of celebrity by depicting it and putting it in the art museum. Um, even when Warhol does give us the celebrity, like here with um, Marilyn Monroe, it's, it's still to remind us of, of how the nature of who we're looking at has changed in pop culture. So here, you know, the isolated Marilyn reminds us of, of how celebrity has become kind of a new religion in our culture. And then in this image that has this repetition, we're reminded of how celebrity 
although it seems to be such a, a powerful position, it actually is dehumanizing in its own way. We don't really know who Marilyn is, um, even if we would name this image by her name. Really, we've lost all of our humanity, and she's just been flattened in this into this kind of caricature of herself, right? This image that is fading away. I think some of his work also comments on how desensitized we become um, to the images that we see and to the lives of the real people behind those images. So when we look at images like these ones, um, this work by, uh, by Warhol of Jackie Kennedy before and um, after the death of her husband, um, we, we think about how we really look at society or look at celebrity in our society. When you walk through the grocery store checkout line and you see all the tabloids and you recognize people who um, you know, are touted as celebrities for good, bad, notorious <laughs> reasons, um, and as we watch the stories of their lives unfold, we really don't feel much for them in terms of empathy for other humans. They just become kind of flattened storybook characters that we watch them go through good and bad times. Um, and I think the same happened in some ways to Jackie Kennedy, where it became a storyline that people watched the same way that they watched other things on television, um, maybe without a lot of personal connection. Um, in this last image, uh, I'm reminded of how Warhol can juxtapose different um, formal cues to kind of uh, play off of our relationships. So here we've got these color uh, combinations that tell us one thing, especially the center two images that have this kind of upbeat pastel coloring. And then as we look at the image and we begin to make out the form of the electric chair, we're confronted by this much darker side. I think these images in particular are a nice way to end because they remind me of that kind of duality within pop art and within culture in the 60s, late 50s and 60s, where there was the very sort of upbeat commercial side, but then there was also this undercurrent that was very much about um, reconstructing a new society, dealing with um, <coughs> national and international concerns. Pop art raises a lot of great questions. Um, does or should art reflect culture, lead culture, educate or elevate? What are our expectations of art? With pop art, it largely reflects culture and then gives us a chance to react. Do we like what we see in that mirror? Um, but should art be leading, educating or elevating? What is the difference between art and life? Uh, what is the difference between art and culture or art and entertainment or art and advertising? Is it just a difference of media, like painting is fine art and printing is a part of uh, advertising? Um, is it about uh, who is making it and how they were trained? What are the distinctions between these different categories? Um, is it important that we keep those distinctions? Are there any limits on what aspects of life should be incorporated into art? So are the Campbell's soup cans too boring, too common? Is that not good material for art making? Um, or the electric chair, is that not good material? Is it okay to be quoting from comic books? And then how does pop art and Warhol's work in particular foreshadow reality TV? I think it's really interesting the idea of taking these boring objects and sort of making them into celebrities. The way that everyday people are chosen for reality shows and then made into this sort of celebrity even if they not, might not be like admirable people, right? Somehow they've become famous and then they're just sort of famous for being famous, right? Um, so I think there's an, a dynamic connection there between pop art and reality television of our era. Um, in terms of the core issues, just to sum up, within pop art there's a mix of traditional and non-traditional. So we have still some painting, but we also have silkscreen, um, screen printing, collage, cardboard works. With skill and technique, it can vary widely. So Lichtenstein, again, had just um, beautiful craft and control where you couldn't even tell that a human had made it, even though it was actually handmade. Versus Warhol, who very intentionally would do these quite sloppy screen prints and let his screens get a little bit too old um, and, and overworked. Um, but he liked that kind of sense of the, the Xerox of a Xerox, this kind of image getting less and less specific and yet we still recognize it as the same person or the same object. 
art may or may not be physically created um, by the, the particular artist. So with Warhol, some of his works were made by him, by his own hand, and some of them were made by other people in the factory. But he becomes more of uh, the concept artist, right? So he comes up with the idea for the work. And this, of course, implies a change in the expression and the artist's intent. So rather than a personal expression, it is a cultural expression, but significantly it's interpreted by the individual artist. So we really sense that Lichtenstein is picking those images for a reason, and Warhol's picking his objects for a reason. <coughs> As distinct from abstract expressionism directly before it, it is really distanced from the trauma of World War II, from that idea of the existential crisis. It's definitely much more influenced by the kind of boom in um, the general U.S. economy after World War II. And um, also we see a change in the image of the artist. So now art, the artist is, can be at least more like a manager or a CEO or even like an architect who designs the work but has other people construct it. And we also see, quite differently than in abstract expressionism, a lot of humor and irony and kind of a playful sensibility to these works. Critique of pop art. So whether we like it or, or hate it, um, it's good to also give a critique of it or consider this point of view. And people often ask, well, is pop art too trendy or popular? Is it just a fad? Is it just too superficial, vapid, meaning kind of empty or humorous? Uh, meaning, should art really be humorous is something people have asked. Uh, shouldn't fine art be a high art? So shouldn't fine art be lofty and sort of removed from everyday culture, certainly removed from advertising and commercialization, is one critique. And then culture is supposed to follow art, not art following culture. So a big shift there. The reaction of the next generations of artists are, are actually too myriad for us to go into completely right here, but we'll get a few as we continue forward. Um, a multitude of reactions, and again, that's one of the reasons that we see pop art as a beginning place for postmodernism, is that there's not just one more evident path forward, but divergent movements happening simultaneously. Um, but we do see the threads of pop art extending into today's work. We see movements that could be described as neo-pop, <coughs> meaning they're still using images from advertising and film and TV today. Um, we still see a lot of work that uses a similar sense of humor and ironic wit. And also many artists are still breaking down boundaries of art and life. Lastly, many other artists have pushed back toward personal expression and sense of sincerity. And some have wanted to restore the sense of the artist's hand, like that unique brush stroke, let's say, or that kind of fingerprint on the artwork. Go ahead and, and head into your online journal. A few sources you might use are the artstory.org, um, the Museum of Modern Art, or a new one here, Artie Factory, um, which had a pretty good overview of pop art with some descriptions and, and analysis of individual uh, artworks. Um, so. Find those sources to get a deeper look, and, and then I will catch you back here for the next one. Thank you.